without hardware, without equipment, there is no science in a way, right? Like we can download all these amazing data sets, but if you really want to be in control of generating data and like doing, answering exciting questions locally and questions that are important for your science and your community, let's say, then you need the proper tools to do it, right? Um, Movik already introduced me, but hello from my side so that I get started. Um, I work at the University of Sussex where I have a job that really that I really, really like, which is developing open source hardware for the Department of Neurosciences. Uh, I'm also volunteering a lot of my time to Trend in Africa, which is an NGO trying to help development in higher education in Africa. So we do a lot of um, sharing of our knowledge so that people can actually um, build their own tools. We do a lot of workshops. I started a small website called Open Neuroscience and I'm working with Julieta Arancio and Alex Cuchera, as Malvika mentioned on this program that it's similar to Open Life Sciences, but for hardware called Open Hardware Makers. Um, all of this started about, I mean, I think I already spoke about like why open hardware, right? Like we need hardware to do the experiments, the things that we do. And here's just one example in life sciences, right? So if you are, um, thinking about microscopes, which is one of the workhorses inside life sciences, right? These tools are from, they were first developed like in the late 1600s, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And this one that you see on the left is actually from 19, the turn of the 20th century. So 1904 or something. And the one on the right is a little bit more recent. As you can see, like the modern microscope didn't change much over the last hundred years. And still, if you want to get one on the right, you would spend something like 10,000 pounds, right? And I, I mentioned costs because although we really like to romanticize things about science in the end, like we still need to pay for things. Um, and so things, these things are really expensive, although the technology in them didn't change much over the last hundred years, right? So there is something wrong there from my perspective. But even if you don't consider that, if you think about you are, let's say, in the global south, where I'm originally from, um, trying to buy a microscope. Um, you only find distributors from the global north, so you have to import things. They only have their, or they mostly have their clients in the global north in mind. So if I bring it back to my hometown in Brazil, where it was super warm and humid, then like this thing is gonna like rust really fast and probably be out of work. If it breaks, I have no local support. I have no idea what's going on inside because it's a, it's a black box. And as COVID-19 has shown us, our um, supply chains for equipment, for, um, for hey, consumables and all, like they are really fragile, right? Like once like there is a disruption from like China and so on, like everybody gets stalled and things get delayed and so on. And so all of this together makes scientific equipment really slow to innovate. Right, because you cannot open, like I'm not gonna fiddle around with a 10,000 pound piece of equipment, right? Like if I break it, like the whole department is gonna want my head. So like I better not fiddle around with that, right? And so this is why like without access to these tools, proper access, there is no science, right? And this is where open source comes in. Um, this is, these are just a few of examples of open source microscopes that are available today if you want to find these projects online, right, you could find and reproduce them right away. And the nice thing about them is that all of them are un under $100, right? Some maybe actually, let's say all of them are under $200, which is like orders of magnitude uh, cheaper than the ones that I just showed you. And they're all portable, right? So here on the left, um, you have the scale here, which is about five centimeters. This is something we developed in the lab a long time ago and we're using for educational purposes and so on but you could do like 80% of the stuff that you do in the labs, right? Um, this one next to it is actually very specialized for fluorescence, which is like a fancy method, right? Like in, in life sciences, but the one that I would like to highlight are these two on like the one left with the yellow one, which is called Open Flexure, which is an amazing project uh, that I really like. I'm not involved with the project myself, but I really like, like the project because they're actually made the papers and proved that this actually is able to detect malaria uh, inside blood cells. So the resolution of this is on par with optical microscopes and you can build it for a fraction of the cost and 3D print parts wherever you are. Actually, a lot of the developers for this are in Tanzania, our partner, 
um, developers with the people here in Bath, which is close by to Brighton where I am. And the other microscope on the right is actually about this big and goes on the head of uh, mice and they can actually do live imaging of uh, brain activity while the animals are performing a certain task. And what I think is really crucial about these two examples, this last two that I said is that the yellow one, the open flexure, they actually show that they can do like the same or better performance than actual commercially available microscopes. And the one on the right is actually providing, which is the Miniscope project can actually provide something that wasn't available before. So before the Miniscope as an open project came along, there was no way to have freely moving mice uh, and record their like brain activity with optical imaging, right? And so this brings a lot of innovation. There is a big community around Miniscope just to like pound on the point that the speakers that came before me said that fostering a community and bringing people into an open project actually is good for research, is good for you, and it's good for innovation and like speeding up the cycles in science and research. So I wanted to keep this kind of short. So this is just a slide that Huli made and I adapted um, to show why we should use open hardware. And I hope I have mentioned this already, even if like too fast and, and giving you a lot of information, uh, but let's like take step again step by step. So because it's reproducible, so we actually use GitHub and GitHub a lot uh, to put out our projects, uh, our open hardware projects, because it's actually super fun to learn how somebody did something, like how the Miniscope, this amazing project works, right? I can go into the documentation and actually see how they put the boards together, how the electronics work and so on. It's super affordable. So from our experience with people that are um, being part of our workshops in Africa, they say, look, this is affordable enough that here in our institution, we can like pull some resources together and get started with open source hardware. Uh, it's repairable because I know like everything that is going on um, inside the hardware, I can also know how to repair it when something goes wrong. But not even that, because I know how everything works. I also know if the data that I get out of it is reliable or not, right? Like, oh, is this PCR? Or is this image from this microscope really what it's supposed to be? Or is it an artifact, right? Because I know how it works, then I know the limitations and the capabilities. And because I know the limitations and capabilities, I know where and how and if I need to customize something, right? So let's say I'm using the open flexure for something, but right now it works on power in the, in the wall socket, right? But I need it with batteries because I know like how it works. I can easily say, okay, if I change this power supply with these batteries, then I can actually bring this to the field and use it outside the lab space or even in a lab where there are constant power failures, right? Um, and putting all of this together, this is then obviously, hopefully if it's done right, it's democratizing, right? Because then it doesn't matter if you are in the global north or if you're doing citizen science or if you are inside academia because you're collecting data with tools that you actually know exactly what they're doing, you can go and say, look, this is my data. This was how it was recorded. And it's, it's, it's good data, right? So we need to discuss data and not whether or not like I have a $10,000 piece of microscope. Um, luckily for us, there is what I'm calling like the Cambrian explosion of open source hardware going on. So what you're seeing here, are a lot of projects um, that are currently available some highlights that I think are really cool. Like here on the top left, you can see this little object on the, on the palm of a hand. This is an atomic force microscope, right? So this goes down to image like really, really, really tiny stuff, right? So it really measures like uh, nanometers and, and, and things that are really small. Then here um, on the bottom row, you can see the, the image where there is somebody holding a little white board. This is actually an EKG machine. And this person actually discovered that like he writes a blog post and I can find the reference later if somebody wants, but he actually finds um, that he has a heart arrhythmia because he was able to play around with um, this EKG and brought it to his doctor and said, look, this is my data. This is how my heart looks like over a 24, 24 hour period. And there is something wrong here, let's fix it, right? And it could have been that he would never like know about this but I think it's interesting that people have the empowerment to like know what's going on with them. But right? on this note, there is also a project that is called 
uh, open insulin, where people are actually making insulin monitors and trying to make their own insulin um, because like price surges of insulin in the US right now, for instance, are crazy. And a lot of people are really having bad times managing to get their hands on the proper insulin that they need and so on. And so this also empowers people to say, you know what, like we are not going to take this nonsense anymore and we're going to do it our own way. Um, and there are many, many other projects, right? Just a little bit of data on something that we're working on at the moment, which is, um, this is something that we're working, but just to show you that what we're seeing here is the number, like the fraction of papers as a percentage of total publications from PubMed over time from the 1990s to 2020 uh, of papers that had either open source hardware, open hardware or open labware in their abstract title or keywords, right? So you can see that this is not growing. I mean, it's still a tiny, tiny fraction of the total number of papers, of course. But what I like here is how fast new, new papers are coming more and more each year. Um, if people are interested in this, I would really recommend taking a look at the GOSH community, which is the global open science hardware community, which is mainly where Huli, Alex and I met. But the point that I like to make here is that this is a really, really global online community most of the time where people really from all continents are discussing open hardware. They're really, really open to newcomers and really willing to help with questions. And there is, I think the most important document that was done collectively, as you can see on the photo on the bottom right, like this was the voting for things in the manifesto that we wrote. It's like, what is the point of the global open science hardware community and what is our manifesto, right? And you can see the points highlighted here. Um, and this tries to make sure that this is, is and still keeps going as uh, a really diverse and horizontal community where things are being discussed and all of these different communities are being taken in consideration. Um, again, I can share the link for this if I did not this yet. I have a slide in the end with useful links. This might be there. Um, a little bit of a shameless advert, I'm sorry. So we are actually finishing um, the curriculum for our new program. And you can pre-register at if you go to openhardware.space and you can also find more uh, information about this. And the idea of this program is to take people that are newcomers into open hardware and to show them best practices, right? So you're gonna cover a lot of things that are quite similar in terms of like, oh, this is GitHub or this is Instructables and these are all these platforms. But also like we're gonna show like points on documentation and licenses and things because hardware, believe it or not, most of hardware projects need at least three different licenses. <laughs> which is different from all the projects that we've been discussing right now. Uh, but yeah, so I just wanted to say, please take a look at the website, get in touch if you want. Like we will be super, super happy to get projects uh, or even just questions from you because we are in the moment where we're finalizing our curriculum and we're ready to launch hopefully in another couple of months uh, and then still run a cohort this year. Um, with that, I would like to say thanks. You can ask me questions. I think you're writing hopefully uh, in the document. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can send me an email as well. I'd be super happy to chat. Um, and just to say that here is a list of what I think are useful links. 